Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Anthony. I am the Marketing and Communications Director for Helms Bakery, where we normally host these Cal Poly LA Metro Series lecture, you know, events um, in person. So I want to welcome Adam and the students and, of course, their fearless leader, Stephen Phillips, who uh, we've been hosting these for several years now. And they're always informative and fun and interesting. And uh, the guest list is um, in, very impressive always. So uh, for those of you who don't know anything about Helm's Bakery, which I assume is probably only Adam on this call, <laughs> is uh, we are an actual, it was an actual working bakery built in 1931. And uh, they would deliver baked goods throughout Los Angeles. And then the Marx family purchased it, the property in the early 70s and began this adaptive reuse, which is um, what it is today. It's a collection of home furnishing, design shops. Uh, we have a great bookstore here, Arcana Books, restaurants, and then the Helms Design Center where we host art, architecture, and design events. That's pretty much what our programming is throughout the year. So um, without taking up any more time, I wanna welcome everyone today. I know we are completely Zoomed out, but um, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Angela. It's uh, always fantastic to have these events and we appreciate the Helms and we're looking forward to uh, maybe being live. I think we're gonna do it now in June for a housing exhibition. So uh, stay tuned everybody to learn more about what that's going to be. Um, you know, my name is Stephen Phillips. I'm the director of the Cal Poly LA Metro Program in Architecture and Urban Design. Most of you all know that. Uh, we run a program uh, for Cal Poly San Luis Obispo here in Los Angeles. Uh, we've been doing this for about 10 to 11 years now. Um, we've gotten certain amounts of attention. We have a wonderful faculty list. We've been growing every year. We have 36 students. You can see them all hanging out in Adam's room. And then our faculty uh, we have here, I guess today we have Jimenez um, Lai and Pavel Getoff. I think Teddy Slowick's with us, Joanna Grant. Um, and we also um, have Ismael Soto. And uh, actually we also have some history theory faculty as well, um, Sarah and Tina. So we're super excited to have this event and I'm really actually excited to get Adam out here. Uh, we've got him from London, which is one of the great benefits of this Zoom world as much as we're tired of it. Uh, we're also kind of taking advantage of these opportunities. And so I think this year we also tried to get some people that we typically couldn't get, but would love to get and you know, Adam, I don't know what to say. I saw your stuff just popping up on the Instagram like probably two, three years ago. And I was like, oh, this is really good. What is it? And I didn't know who you were. I knew nothing about you. I'm just kind of just seeing this stuff on Instagram. I don't know who was the person who got your Instagram following in our world. Um, wow. You know, and it's just uh, pretty impressive, exciting um, work. Very obviously colorful, but also very uh, intelligent within that color terrain. And you also have other sort of... Uh, I know, I'm even up to urban strategies that you're kind of playing around with. So as an architect, it's really uh, amazing to see the launching of your career and to see this happening. So I really wanted to pull you in and get a talk uh, with our students. Um, so thank you for being with us. And I'm just gonna quickly introduce Adam to those of you who don't already know him, but should know him soon. Um, Adam Nathaniel Furman is a London-based designer an artist of Argentine and Japanese heritage, whose practice ranges from architecture and interiors to sculpture, installation, writing, and product design. He co-runs the Saturated Space Research Group on Color at the AA uh, Architecture Association in London, and was a studio master of productive exuberance at Central St. Martin's College of Art. Furman published the book, Revisiting Postmodernism with Sir Terry Farewell, uh, Farrell, of, uh, for the Royal Institute for British Architects in 2018, and has written for numerous publications internationally. Presently, he is writing a new uh, work for Reba, which is Queer Spaces, an Atlas of LGBTQ Plus Places and Stories. Uh, looking forward to reading that. Uh, Furman is also the recipient of several awards, including the Blueprint Prizes for Design Innovation in 2014, uh, Best Small Project in 2018, the UK Rome Prize for Architecture 2014 to 15 and FX Product Designer of the Year 2019. 
Um, congratulations on all of that. Furman's work is in the collections of the Sir John Stone Museum and Design Museum London, the Abet Laminate Museum, the National Gallery of Victoria, and the Carnegie Museum of Art, and continues to be exhibited in numerous cities around the world. Please uh, join us at uh, this, a little bit of a strange time for us, Moon, um, uh, but we're working with uh, our international colleagues, uh, Adam, Nathaniel Furman. Hey, th ooh, thank you for that. Wow. Um, <laughs> and thank you also for doing the, the sort of pre lunchtime uh, slot. I'm very, very grateful that I didn't have to stay up until one in the morning. Um, so uh, how do I, I have to share my screen, uh, which I do here and host is disabled. Stephen, you've disabled host uh, screen participation or something. If you have to click one of the buttons to let me share. Hmm. Uh, Joseph, are you still here? I am, and it's done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and we'll do that now. I will share, hopefully, the correct screen. Uh, can you all see Joyful Deviance? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to give, it's quite a, it's quite a sort of personal meander um, through my sort of messy and haphazard uh, career. Um, everything that I say, I just want to qualify, it's all, it's all completely from my perspective, it's all very much my opinion, and I'm not, I'm, you know, if I mistakenly sound like I'm generalizing, I do not intend to at any point, so this is a very kind of personal perspective on all the issues that I, that I talk about. Um, ooh, how do I do this? Aha, uh -huh, okay, can you all see uh, a kid dancing the Vogue at his bar mitzvah? Yes. Okay, great. So that's not actually me, but it might as well have been me. Um, it was it was quite a thing in the early 90s to to um, be a little gay boy in your bar mitzvah and just kind of not really realize what you were doing and totally go on the dance floor and show off your Madonna moves. And uh, that was me. And my teenage years after that were just as much fun. So I grew up in London. I, I sort of possibly stupidly came out uh, very young um, at 14, 15 years old in high school, um, you know, which uh, in a posh, posh English high school is possibly not the best thing to do, but had the most um, incredible time in the London um, subcultural scene of the sort of mid of late 90s, uh, mostly the queer scene, but also others, which was where I kind of found my people. I also found my identity um, and sort of this was the counterpoint to a sort of, very, frankly, a very unpleasant uh, time at school because we had something called Section 28, which uh, Russia has a law at the moment, which says that you can't promote homosexuality. Um, and we, that's actually based upon something that Thatcher put into law called Section 28, which was that local authorities couldn't promote homosexuality, which meant the kids at school didn't get support. And there's a whole story behind that. But the London subcultural scene was a place where kids like me could find support and kind of believe in themselves. Um, and a very important part of that world was aesthetic and visual culture. So the externalization of, of kind of alternative identity, which was still at that time quite difficult to be in the public world, um, was celebrated through a really fantastic kind of vibrant um, scene of interior design, nightclub design, graphic design, protest um, sim um, symbology, um, and I was very much part of that. Um, and then I went to architecture school, um, which <laughs> was uh, a little bit of a shock to the system. Um, and architecture school, which I went to in 2001, was a sort of very door and depressed place where people were sort of wearing black turtlenecks. Um, everyone was, people crying in the corridors. Everyone was making, you know, black models with black uh, presentations with lots of complicated lines with uh, designs that looked like they were alien squid or a sort of 13 year old boys um, sort of science fiction, you know, wet dream of what the future might be like. And um, we were told that that was what architecture had to be and that it had to be like that because technology was something that we had to represent through the work that we did. It was a kind of technophiliac approach. Um, and obviously, you know, coming from a, a background where I had come out in relatively difficult circumstances, and also from a background where my parents are both immigrants, um, and identity embodied through aesthetics, fashion, interiors, um, and objects was something that was is still very important to my family. It's quite common 
amongst immigrant communities to come to a school uh, or a sort of profession where you were not allowed to discuss any of these things was very difficult. Um, and of course, I, I didn't, you know, just I guess like in high school, I didn't really accept it. Um, I pushed back as strongly as possible from very early on. And there was a kind of, and this is something that's happened to me repeatedly throughout my career. There's a kind of repetitive revisiting of coming out or having to come out again in different ways, in different arenas, uh, initially at school, then at university, and you'll see later in the profession. Um, and so there was a kind of- Is it you know, possible for you to share your screen full screen? Oh, am I not- So sorry to interrupt your story. Oh God, um, I'm so sorry. I thought it, I thought it just did that. They are uh, perfect, great. Yeah. Thank you, sorry, great, perfect. Okay, embarrassed. Um, <laughs> um, and so in architecture school, um, there was a kind of pushback that I gave, um, which meant that I was sort of always the problematic one uh, in all of my studios as to why uh, visual culture, why aesthetics could not be discussed and present within spatial design in a way that embodies and talks about identity, gender, things that I was very interested in. Um, and throughout, you know, my, I sort of created a very strong uh, kind of discursive antagonism throughout my journey at the Architectural Association during its sort of parametric years. If you just imagine lots of sort of you know, little Patrick Schumacher's walking around saying things that you didn't understand. Uh, that's sort of the context of it. Um, and that, that did push me to be, I guess, more extreme in the kind of work that I was producing and also much more forceful in the kind of arguments that I was putting forward than I ever otherwise would be. And I actually think that this was a very positive thing. That antagonistic relationship, again, yet again, the need to exist, to, ex to uh, the desire and the ability to exist required having to be very forceful in explaining myself and also constructing a very kind of coherent uh, design aesthetic and approach very early on. So I was kind of producing these, kind. Of, this, this is from my final project at the Architectural Association, um, which was a church in, in Rome, it's kind of a bit mad, but I was sort of producing these two and a half meter high drawings and sort of models which were very, very different ways of talking about the, a lot of the issues that they were talking about, but including and incorporating questions of um, aesthetics, identity, sensuality, um, and also history in different ways. But again, I'll get to that later. It's kind of alternative historiographies, which is why I'm doing this book at the moment. Um, and for instance, here you can see, this is, these are 3D printed models. Um, and I would use 3D printing, or I would use uh, you know, three axis or five axis milling but I would use it in a way that was very much at the service of expression. Um, and that was a way that I could kind of, I could sort of blag, I don't know if you have that word in America, but I can kind of, I could kind of bullshit my way into doing what I wanted by addressing this technology question that they had. And this is something that's run throughout my career. It's sort of needing to address the questions of the day, but then sort of, I guess you can say querying them, but sort of slipping in my agenda. Um, and so, you know, people were horrified by this, but at the same time, it was kind of ticking the boxes that they were interested in ticking. Um, and these, um, oh, and, and, you know, the, the also a desire, I guess, from, from very early on to make real things. So rather than sort of sticking entirely in the, in the digital and the kind of virtual, um, the idea of sensuality in the real world, bodies in space, the smell of things, the touch of things, um, was very important to me. So already quite early on, I was already sort of trying to hook up with companies, which was a way of getting outside of the academy. It was working with commercial enterprise um, to produce actual prototypes of things. And for instance, this is from my uh, project to the AA. These are sort of, one, these are one-to-one -one voussoirs from a sort of large vault on a project that were highly ornamental, but also structural that were produced with a stone yard uh, in, in Italy. Um, sort of working with them in a sort of spot in a sponsorship in kind way, which is something that I still do. It's sort of working with companies to further, um, I guess a more artistic re research agenda without, without having to rely on the academy where I have never been able to fit. So we'll, we'll get onto this later. Um, so it was very exciting. It was very thrilling, very antagonistic, made lots of enemies all the way through university, but was feeling very confident when I graduated. And it was 2008 and I graduated and the world ended, uh, which was, you know, brilliant. I mean, the year before I had friends who were graduating, they flew to Kuala Lumpur and they were designing skyscrapers like literally the next day. Um, and I, 
me and my generation, we graduated, uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed and uh, pretty much all the architects were let go. Um, so there were no jobs around. Um, and there's a kind of whole uh, generation in the UK, I'm sure, it, I don't think it was as bad in America, but um, in, the, in, in the UK, there were lots of people uh, who were graduated with amazing skills who were trying to find ways of producing projects that, well, I guess didn't rely on, you know, actually having clients and having um, budgets to do things or working with local authorities. Assemble are the most famous. I'm sure you all know Assemble. There was a joke that someone said, like, you're never, you're never more than 20 meters away from a, a journalist writing an article on Assemble. Um, and they're amazing, um, but they were very much part of a kind of zeitgeist of my generation. I'm a sort of, I'm an old millennial um, who were very interested in a specific way of doing things. So a kind of, uh, a sort of socially aware, um, kind of woody pop up -y approach that was kind of relating to existing communities in a very specific way that was very contextual in a very specific way. Um, and I really wanted to be part of a group. I really wanted, and I, you know, I would help build things like I would go to, you know, um, pop up gardens and help them help sort of friends in these uh, collectives build things. But nobody, nobody wanted to do shit. Uh, sorry, nobody wanted to do stuff like this. Um, which was what I wanted to do, um, and I wanted, but I wanted to do it with art, with architects. I mean, I could I could work in festivals, I could work in clubs, but I wanted to work in the kind of intellectual, discursive world of architectural design that I loved so much, and produce things which which talked about these issues, um, which were which are aesthetic as well as discursive. But I couldn't find anyone, um, so I ended up. Um, effectively, finally, I got jobs right, which was very nice, and producing on the side. Uh, sort of as a sort of forlorn, forlorn sad, very colourful uh, person, uh, seeing all these people but doing these sort of pop-up cinemas everywhere, wishing I could do something like that. I sort of did a lot of what you would call paper projects on my own, and they were not for competitions, they were just random, like I was just producing designs that were exploring the questions that I was interested in at the time, and I did that for quite some time, sharing them uh, on blogs initially, if anyone knows what that is, um, and then on to, I was part of the blog sphere, um, and then onto social media when that, that became a thing. And I'll come on to that later as to how my career was entirely dependent on, uh, was dependent on social media. Um, my, there's, uh, most of my clients I've met in the way that Stephen came across me. Um, so while I was sort of working, pushing toilets around in Revit, um, and actually for myself, it wasn't toilets. I was pushing handrails. I mean, this, I spent three months doing handrails in the escape staircase of a skyscraper. <laughs> um, but while I was, while I was doing that, um, I was doing this sort of paper projects and um, also uh, doing some teaching. So the, you know, trying to get any opportunities to explore the ideas wherever I could. Um, and this is the first course that I taught was at the Architectural Association. Um, here we go. So digital ceramics, okay. Uh, because you only got to get anything if you called it digital at the time. And it's kind of still a little bit like that. Um, I mean, they're not digital. They're the kind of approach that I liked, which was technology is a tool like everything else. And it's part of a process which incorporates craft and many other things on the way. And students had to make from the very initial sketch through to working everything up in detail on Rhino, through to making their own molds through to casting, through to firing, through to glazing and firing again, and then through to mechanically assembling one-to-one -one prototypes of rain screen ceramic walls. So these are one and a half meters each. I uh, don't know what that is in feet. Can't believe you guys still use it. Um, and I don't know, big. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a way of showing them how to sort of work with the hand, but also um, part of this was that they had to kind of explore their own aesthetics. So, and this is a process I go through with, with all of the classes that I teach. It's a kind of aesthetic purification where you sort of get, um, yeah, I don't know, Valerio Algiati out of your head. Um, and you sort of start to think about the things that you genuinely like and are genuinely interested in. And these are some weird things that sort of came from that process. Um, and little, little bit by little bit, opportunities started to come my way. And, you know, whereas my peers, I, I mean, I have peers now who are literally building large structures. I'm, I'm still doing installations, but um, my peers were doing actual architectural projects, but I was finding opportunity to do small things like this as a little pavilion. Um, and each one of those, whether it's a little, sort of, well, it's not that little, but sort of medium sized sculptures like this, um, or pavilions like this, were you know, the typical young architect, an opportunity to, to push every single idea that I ever had into a tiny little poor thing that couldn't hold it. So this had like 
far too many ideas and every every part of it is a sort of material exploration uh, of how I could do those things at university that they were doing with an axis machine milling and laser cutting and water jet cutting, but in, in a sort of little manifesto of, of my, uh, my, I guess, sensual manner. Um, and here looking at how I can sort of make 3D printing into something that is deeply sensual and suggestive and a bit cheeky. Um, this, this was uh, made to try and go into the Royal Academy, but uh, it, it, it did not get into the Royal Academy. Um, <laughs> and uh, scaling up bit by bit, and each time thinking or imagining that the project that I was doing was an architectural exploration. So even if I was doing a spoon, I was imagining all the architectural questions around it. This, this was at the time the world's largest piece of 3D printed and glazed ceramic until somebody dropped it in, um, uh, where were they? in Portland, somebody dropped it into a thousand pieces. So that no longer exists. However, I was very happy for the insurance money. Um, and this, this kind of being stuck into doing objects was something that I guess could be considered in some way slightly humiliating, but it's actually something that I really enjoyed. While I was at university, um, I made pocket money. I mean, I made money from uh, being an antique dealer. So I was a, I was a gold star uh, dealer on eBay of ceramics. Um, and I got very much into the history of them. Um, but it's something that comes from my background. Again, it's, it's sort of the question or the way that immigrant families often construct an identity um, at their home, which is a hybrid between the lost country or the country that they can't go back to or the country that they could go back to that has changed beyond recognition, so no, no longer exists, the new country, and then the family that kind of sticks somewhere in the, in the middle, objects very often become extremely important to them, which it was for my family. Also, I think of space rather than thinking of space as a sort of unitary, endless, expansive, um, abstract thing, you know, which is whitewash, sort of washed wall, you know, subtle light, emptiness, which is actually, I think, a kind of really dangerous way of the architect to universalize space um, and turn it into something that is completely controllable, right? A sort of empty void that belongs to them. It's kind of paternalistic way of thinking of space. I think of space as a collection of objects. It's a collection of stories, narratives, sensualities, um, meanings which are lost, uh, accumulations over time. It's the opposite of the control that an architect has. And this comes from the way I see space into, in relation to, I, I guess we can talk about queerness later on, but um, if we start in the closet, okay, the idea of coming out the closet, so hence the closet on the left, very subtle. Um, for me, that's really important because if you're born into a body which you're not comfortable with, which is a body which is not acceptable in, out, in outside society, okay? Or if you're, you have a body which wants to do things which are not acceptable in outside society, then it's very important for you to use the closet to create an identity that you're comfortable with, right? Clothes become your warrior clothes. They become your mask. They become your protection. And so kind of coming out of the closet for me is actually, and looking in the mirror, that specular reflection is a really important moment of architectural construction of identity where you protect yourself by constructing your identity to go out and be able to face the outside world. And this is something that's very common to a lot of queer kids that I know, but it's actually very common to a lot of people from a lot of backgrounds who struggle with the norms of society. Um, and then if we move from that, once one step further out is to the space of a room and in the room you want to you can externalize yourself in a safe environment if you're somebody that cannot just be who you are you're not represented in public space then the interior the interiority is something where you can safely externalize your identity and create a cocoon that accepts who you are represents who you are and where you are validated as an existing and relevant and valid being um, and that is done with objects. And then beyond that, there's a space and we'll get to public space much later on. I'll sort of build up to that. But it's, this is why I guess I think of um, space as a collection of objects because it's the way that you externalize yourself and take over um, abstract extension, the way architects would think of it. Um, if, you've, if you've ever been to um, uh, the living room of someone who's recently passed away, um, who you didn't know, it's something that you really can't help but feel very profoundly affected by. Um, you know, even if they're, I mean, this is a messy room, even if they're sort of absolutely have no sensibility for design whatsoever, the way that they, they kind of 
uh, arrange their objects, the type of objects that they have, the way that something is sitting above something else, the particular mess in a particular corner, it's extremely evocative and as a whole can very powerfully convey someone's personality as an atmosphere. Um, and as uh, you know, when you get to being collectors, um, that's something that becomes more kind of cultivated and is more pronounced because it's something which is kind of actively constructed and cared for over a longer period of time. Uh, this is Madeleine Riesendorp's incredible collection of tchotchkes and plastic souvenirs from around the world. Um, and this is something which has been very formalized um, since the Renaissance, you know, since, the, since um, Lorenzo Medici's Studiolo, which was meant to be his private space where he could externalize um, his, his sort of learning and knowledge, his whole over the world and his artistry and sophistication. Um, but it's something which we see everywhere today and is especially common in popular figures um, marginalized communities. Um, and uh, this is just a figure, a public figure called uh, Camilla batman in the UK, who sort of holds all of her um, television interviews in her, in her um, office, which is constructed as a kind of representation of, of her identity. Um, it's something which um, I think humans do naturally. So the first, sort of biologically, not naturally, it's a dangerous word, natural. But um, I think the first, the first thing that we do as kind of social beings as humans is create ex externalized expression. So we painted the caves, we tattooed ourselves. Every society that you can find constructs and makes jewelry, right? Uh, augmentations of the body, symbols and representations of mythologies, of hierarchies, um, of kind of social codes. Um, and that happens immediately with the very first architecture, which was woven. So the moment that you started creating um, sort of fabric enclosures, which is when we leave the caves, immediately with the weave, the weave starts having meaning and the weave starts becoming expressive, aesthetic, representative, not in a direct way, but becoming representative of different things. It's something we biologically do. We do it in the spaces around us. Um, this is a fantastic example of what Charles Moore's Charles Moore built a house wherever, wherever he was sort of a professor. His final one was in Austin. It's now his archive. My dream is to spend a kind of month there uh, going through because Colin Rose archives there now as well. Um, but he's a sort of a very rare example of a kind of very successful academic respected late 20 or sort of second half of the 20th century architect who did all of these things um, and uh, was also queer and externalized himself in all of these ways. Um, and it's unusual because um, there's normally a code of belonging, which is aesthetic. And there's a kind of, there's a range of those. So there's a kind of maybe four or five different codes of aesthetic belonging that belong to architects who are part of the academy. And they represented or talk about it as if they are not aesthetic. So they're universal. No, we don't talk about aesthetics, but actually they are. And it's very unusual for people. And I guess more with postmodernism had an unusual opportunity to, to actually be accepted as part of the academy, academy when their aesthetics do not conform to those. Um, and obviously when you're, a, at least the way I think of it, when you're a designer or when you're an architect, um, a little bit like a collector or a person who's externalizing themselves, no matter what you do, your creations are going to be like sections of you in time. You're making them. Um, and this is just Ron Arad's website, but it's like the idea of taking every object that a designer makes or an architect makes over time and thinking of each one as an expression of identity, of their identity, of their relationship with society in general. Um, so, um, how, am I how long have I gone so far, Stephen? I just want to know how much I have left. Oh, oh you're on no. mute. You have, you have another half hour. Okay, great, thanks. Plus, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, oh God, where was I? So I was talking back here. Um, yeah, so it, I was working, pushing around handrails, you know, fucking, oh, sorry, messing, messing up uh, you know, group families on, on very complicated Revit files and getting in trouble. Um, uh, oh, messing up the ceiling heights at the Watergate Hotel. That was a, the entire drawing set, which was one of my great moments working in an office. Um, but, and all, all the time looking for career opportunities. You know, I, you know, the, gate, the gatekeepers, the, the Guardian writers, the magazine, you know, they were not people who would be interested in, in my work or giving me opportunities because my work was very much, and it still is to a certain degree, ridiculed as being superficial, um, silly. I mean, PERMO is a kind of great way to sort of dismiss it. 
Um, and so I was always looking for opportunities to kind of create work without needing the gatekeepers. So social media was one of was one of those opportunities to kind of try and reach people. Another one was um, residencies and bursaries. Um, and I was very, very fortunate to uh, become designer in residence at the Design Museum in London in 2013, which was my kind of first big break, um, where you get supported and you do a residency for three months to create a project which is entirely up to you. And then like a, a billion people see it um, at the Design Museum. Um, and I decided, and the theme was identity, which was perfect for me. Um, and my, my sort of proposal was to come up with a character. And I very often do this with my projects when it's a sort of more research, research based project, I'm not a fan of that word, but um, in, order, in order for myself to, Im to, to immerse myself into the project in a really kind of extreme way that in a similar way to Greek actors who would put on a mask and actually they can, they can act in a sort of much freer way when they're not connected, their identity is not connected to what they're projecting. And so I would, I would, I, I did that very often also before this project. And I created a sort of 20th century paradigmatic 21st century designer who uh, I locked in his flat for three months. Um, and the only um, kind of criteria that uh, he had to live by was that he had to create an object every day. He had to design an object every day. And that object had to be the embodiment of what he was living through, which was his social experiences through social media, email, telephone. Um, and those things had to be either delivered to the door or they could be made at home. So it was either basically either 3D printing or laser cutting or something like that, or clay, you know, clay, I could make clay at home. Um, and this was a way of, of, of looking at technology as a, as a sort of way of freeing the designer from the constraints of sort of the capitalist consumer economy and turning objects into things which are just pure vessels of identity. Uh, and uh, yeah, so 3D, 3D printing, and these, these are some of the ceramics. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, for instance, like the, the stories, and, and I kind of ended up living this. So I, I was the only resident who was working full time. So I was sort of working in an office, kind of drooling half asleep during the day, pushing, pushing toilets around. Um, and then in the evening, I sort of wasn't sleeping and was actually living this experience, which I hadn't intended, um, but I was in the end. Um, and each of these stories were things like generalized anxiety disorder, you know, stalking your ex uh, on, on Instagram and then like clicking by mistake on, you know, a photo with someone else three years ago. Um, and, uh, or, you know, becoming obsessed with uh, low res, um, kind of low res pixelated digital reconstructions of Carthage from the late 90s. I, there's a lot of different stories there. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I kind of really living them because also, you know, I would make videos where I was falling in love with the bars that uh, replaced my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> that was that was my part. There's a lot of licking going on actually, because the sen sensuality has always been a really important part of my uh, of my practice. Uh, not 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 in a sort of overtly sexual manner actually, just just in a manner of just really really loving the the physicality of the world, <laughs> you know, the sensuality of it. Um, and so in the end, I sort of literally did produce a very large quantity of objects. Uh, again here very important was working uh, with sponsorship. So getting sponsored by a lot of uh, 3D, 3D printing companies in order to be able to go wild and then them getting a benefit out of it, um, which was very helpful to me. And these are relationships that I've, which I've continued to this, to this day. Um, and in the end, I killed him um, a little bit like you have these um, whole studios in some museums of an artist who's passed away. Um, you have Eduardo Palozzi's entire um, incredible studio in the National Gallery in, in Edinburgh. Um, and I think Brancusi's is in Paris in, in the Pompidou. Um, it's, it's, a, it's just like the living room, okay? It's just like the collection. It's a way of showing the entirety of a personality uh, as an atmosphere through the collected objects and the disposition of a space, okay? And this is really important to me because I don't like narrative and I don't, I don't like narrative in the end products of what I do. I do narrative in the process, but for me, um, it's very, very important that there's a, there's a kind of instant sensuality and atmosphere that is conveyed as a feeling in the end result. And I think that's what these things do, right? You don't need to read one of those ridiculous curator's texts to understand when you look at an artist's studio, you just sort of let your mind wander and linger and you get a feel for it all. So I killed him. He, well, he died of a heart attack because he took too much caffeine, too many caffeine pills. Um, and I took, took all of his stuff and sort of reconstructed a notional studio in the design museum. Um, and there was that, but then there was also the layers of all the stories because each one of these objects has a kind of fully written story to it 
again, because I, I need narrative in the process, not necessarily the end, but they were all there and kind of embedded in, in iPads, um, as well as there being uh, a film and a video, which was kind of like um, a poetic version um, of all of the kind of concepts, the discourse, the kind of theory, the, the textual work that went on behind all of this project was turned into what I would describe as, if any of you know Star Trek, there's a thing called a Vulcan mind meld, which is where Spock touches on someone's head and woo, sees his whole life in like half a second. So the idea of these films, which are normally about one and a half to, to four minutes long, is that they're kind of poetic Vulcan mind melds that don't really make sense, but they do make sense, a little bit like poetry. And that was that 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 was there confusing a lot of a lot of people in the in the space, but kids kids liked it. Kids tend to like my work. Um, and so this this kind of was something that I continued following the the ability to produce objects in a way that I could afford. You know, I didn't need I didn't really need clients, um, and I was finding opportunities through these companies that I started to have a relationship with to to design objects and actually have product lines which were available online and um, at the same time writing about them and exploring much bigger issues um, to do with otherness, queerness, um, you know, alternative histories, uh, very often getting lost in kind of histories of class, uh, kind of alternative histories of classicism. Um, and, you know, kind of unabashedly, and this kind of, again, it's in an antagonistic relationship with the architects around me, kind of really going for the, <laughs> the commercial aspect. I can tell you, I never really made any proper money, um, but at least the kind of showing that I was working in a way that was not afraid of um, consumerism, of selling, you know, of, of shop, as we call it in England, you know, like, oh my God, he's talking shop at dinner, no. Um, because that was something that I found that a lot of these sort of, especially sort of left-wing academic architects, of which there are a lot of in London, get very, very angry about, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, disgusting capitalist architects designing, you know, kettles for, for, for people, you know, that are affordable, it's disgusting, it's selling out. Um, and so I kind of went, went hell for leather into that as well um, and found different ways of financing it. So these were, I didn't know about crowdfunding when I did these, but these were done on subscription, which was crowdfunding before crowdfunding, which is where you just find people in real life and they subscribe and they give you money. And then uh, at the end, you give them one of the objects. And I had 39, mostly friends of my mother um, <laughs> who signed up, who signed up to, uh, to pay for these to be produced, uh, and then they, they were produced in London um, in, in, a, in a sort of uh, local workshop uh, with friends that I knew. Um, and this is something that kind of took its own steam, right? I started to get, I actually started to get real commissions uh, to do objects uh, in London, which has quite a nice little design ecosystem. There's a lot of little events going on, small commissions. Um, these are some uh, rocking vases, um, which I don't think I have any more images of, but they, they're sort of like Sabutio, which is a game that you can play with rocking things. So you put flowers in and they rock. And anyway, there's a cheekiness that, che that creeps into a lot of my work. Um, and, um, and also kind of thumbing my finger at different, I guess, architectural communities. So this antagonistic relationship, again, one of whom, uh, one of the communities of whom is uh, the classicists, who are these sort of very, very pedantic tweed, tweed suit wearing, um, uh, a lot of them are fantastic, but architects who sort of talk endlessly about corner, the corner uh, detail, um, you know, on a, on a sort of Doric entablature. Um, and, uh, you know, I love classicism so much. And, you know, that is literally not, that's the classicism I really don't like. It's kind of the pedantic of, it's like people who, who get obsessed about apostrophes, just like, just shut up, man, you know, <laughs> um, chill out. It's about the meaning of what's being said. Um, and so there's a whole thread of my stuff that's, this is, these are called first floor mugs, so piano nobile. And they're kind of having fun uh, with classicism. Um, and these, these chairs are, um, and, and I guess querying it. And I'm not gonna talk specifically on that topic, I don't think, but you can ask me later. Um, and there's a kind of distortion of existing norms or of existing well-known well -known things, which are sort of synthesized in a slightly unusual way where the origins are still recognizable, but is very important to me. It's kind of cheeky aspects. So here you can see, um, there's a lineage of Arne Jacobson's uh, bent plywood chair, which was then picked up by Sana with their bunny chair. And so this is my sort of like, um, well, my sort of uh, human form inspired version of that. Um, and the kind of, a kind of cheeky but non-sexual pleasure and joy of non-gendered sensuality that, that talks about body shapes is something that permeates a lot of uh, sort of one particular thread of my work. So forms that look like 
boobs or bums or earlobes, um, you know, or vaginas or testicles or penises, or, but you don't know. And it's kind of never clear which is which and they're not sexualized. Um, and sometimes I, I have quite a lot of fun with that. So I won this commission for uh, a couple of pieces of furniture, like a small furniture collection from an Italian furniture brand by presenting it as this, this is, you know, you know, um, you know, people, this is a chair that wants to eat your bum right up. Um, you know, and obviously that's a reference to um, being eaten out. Um, and, you know, people sort of start to respond to that eventually, that kind of thing. Um, and so the next thing that sort of created my career was an opportunity in the British Academy in Rome. Uh, the American Academy has the same thing. I would highly recommend all of you applying to that if you're interested in doing sort of more creative research-based work, because the American Academy has like 50 million times more money and has like lots of positions, whereas the UK one only has one place. Um, and it was the, it's effectively the architectural urban scale version of identity parades. So it was looking at history, identity, uh, stylistic expression at the scale of a city, which I feel is representative and symbolic of many things that I find fascinating in architecture. It's the city that invented the souvenir. It's a city that in kind of invented selling itself, right? Externalizing itself. Um, in a really potent and interesting and powerful way that undermines any ideas of authenticity. It's interesting because it's supposed to supposedly like the city of authenticity, but it's the city actually, which is more Las Vegas than Las Vegas. Like it's constantly reproducing itself over its history. Um, this, is, this is a painting on the left by Panino, Panini. I think it's like his name means like sandwich sandwiches or something like that. Um, but he was producing souvenirs um, in the 18th century. Um, and this idea of an entire identity of a city being beautifully and evocatively compressed into its most abstract and diluted form is something that I think is very potent. Um, and it's this, also it's a city that through this imaginative re reinvention, like this, its compression of itself into these souvenir objects, the way it sold itself abroad through paintings and objects, which kind of over-exaggerated what Rome was actually like, it also collected artists and those artists would reimagine the city itself. So there's a whole lineage of these from Piranesi on, actually from Poussin onwards. Um, Piranesi here famously with his, you know, obviously the Carcheri, but then this is a view of the, uh, the Appia, completely imaginary, but based on a really deep understanding of the city of Rome, but taking it to a, in a direction which in the end, which was very imaginative and, and very sort of personal and subjective, but in the end influenced architects that then changed cities around the world and also changed Rome itself. Another example that I'll quickly mention is Giorgio de Chirico, um, who is, you know, famously, and I think half of Britain's architecture is sort of vaguely based on him via the fascists at the moment, but an, an a, a painter from Greece who came to Rome via Turin, um, who was obsessed with the kind of, again, this souvenir idea of the kind of abstract reduction of an, a local architecture to its very essence. But for him, it was a kind of universal architecture of classicism. Um, and he never painted Rome, so he came to Rome but he only collected, he said, I think he said something famous, like I've never seen the Colosseum, rubbish. But I mean, this is a statement that he said, of course he saw it, but he never painted it directly. He would buy tchotchkes and toys. So if you go to a studio, there's kind of little plastic toys that are meant for like German children visiting Rome. And he would say like, these are a better representation of Rome than Rome itself. And actually he, all of his paintings were based on those souvenirs. Um, and his artwork, which captured as the Italian architects of the 1930s said, Romanita, which they were very interested in, in, um, in representing Romanness, right? They, they, they then built whole areas of Rome and they rebuilt whole sections of other cities in Italy and also central Rome based upon effectively the approach and the style of Giorgio de Chirico's paintings saying that it was the truly authentic version of Rome when actually these were based upon child souvenirs which were designed and made in plastic uh, for tourists, the kind of very, very kind of essence of the unauthentic. And there's a kind of a lot of stories like that. And my, my proposal for the project was to unearth a kind of a treasure trove of alternative, alternative, I mean, other histories in the city that I could then collect in my own grand tour, I guess, like I was a Poussin, right? And I would then invent my own version of Rome, just like I say these other architects and designers did over time. And I did that. So this is this is one of the versions that I or kind of one of the, the kind of designs that I produced, um, each of which were turned again into a, a, a story or a, or a narrative or a, a kind of article which were then published on the architectural review every two weeks. So it kind of forced me to kind of 
again, sort of teaming up with other companies, external companies, it kind of forced me to be uh, really serious and put these each together in a kind of very coherent manner. And so each of these kind of narratives and alternatives histories, which turn into these sort of wild designs of mine, which are kind of compressions of all of the aesthetics that I was looking into. Oh, uh, this is a fun one. This is a, so this is a design an interiority based upon the story of how Valentino had a sort of fight to death with McDonald's that was opened its first ever outlet in Italy directly opposite um, his studio. And it was kind of the battle of the true reds uh, in, in Italy in the in sort of 1986. Um, and each of, each of these um, was a whole story. But then I also went out on a lot of works, walks and did hand drawings. And there was a kind of process of, 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 um, of distillation, of kind of abstraction of turning all of those ideas and those stories into collections of more abstract shapes, which could then become souvenirs. So what I then took was a, these sort of shapes and forms from each of these walks that I would take very often with a, a couple of particular historians that I'm still very good friends with. Um, and then these would become an object that was based on one of the stories. And each of those would become one of these, which in the end turned into my souvenir city. So it's kind of taking a lot of content, a lot of kind of writing, a lot of kind of theory of history of investigation of things that were published of designs and turning them into the very opposite of what might be considered serious, sort of turning it into souvenirs and presenting the project entirely in that manner. Um, and luckily, very luckily, that was taken up by the Sir John Soames Museum, which is sort of, I guess, a spiritual home uh, in architecture of, a, of this kind of approach in relation to objects. So there's a lot of people who've done this in, in, in history, but they're not part of the canon. So a bit like Charles Moore, the unusual situation where he became part of the canon, Sir John Stone is another architect who unusually with a very kind of odd approach became part of the canon um, and also got a commission there to produce what is now the world's largest 3D printed glazed ceramic that was used the insurance money from the other one and it's now in the Sir John Stone's museum collection. And it really pissed off. Like I think the Spectator magazine, which is a very, which jo Boris Johnson used to be the editor of, um, wrote a review and called it, I think they called it sort of silly childish twaddly things. So it really irritates the classicists, which made me very happy, happy because it breaks all, it broke all the rules. Uh, and uh, I can, you can imagine that this in the Sir John Soane's museum was a little bit of a shock. Um, and so I've sort of followed uh, through um, the sort of stepping up the same ideas from little objects through to larger objects, through to kind of speculations about the city um, to also um, discussing um, sort of parallel um, explorations uh, in, a, in a more academic context, sort of, I guess, trying to get um, a bit, little bit more respect or forums for discussion for these topics that I care about, which are almost entirely related to aesthetics and expression, the primary one of which is colour. So I set up uh, with Anthony Malinowski, who's a really fantastic architect, architectural scale artist in the, in, uh, in the UK. We set up Saturated Space nine years or 10 years ago now. Um, and we've had like, we've had nine symposiums, each one with lots of speakers. We've published lots of academic texts. We've taught a lot. We've, we've organized a lot of kind of discussion groups. And it was a way to get color to not just be uh, something that you don't think about and use uh, on a primary school really badly because architects seem to think that on primary schools you have to just do kind of baby glow colors everywhere. Um, and it's something to really think of as an active political agent in the public realm, in discourse, um, and that, that's been a really fantastic experience to, to sort of pilot uh, or to run over the past few years. You can check out the website and we've had some amazing contributions. Andreas Angelidakis and Alexandra Lang, when she was producing her book, sort of fleshed out one of her chapters, producing a great piece for us. Um, and so in colour, sort of while my colour, I have an extremely unsubtle uh, <laughs> taste in colour. I love it. Um, I, I sort of have a synesthetic relationship to it. I, I kind of almost, I can almost taste colour. Uh, when I use it, um, but it's it's also quite a provocative thing, and so I do use it in a way that is very um, um, sort of intentional. And the way I think of it with a lot of my projects is as dragging. So it's a kind of it's it's like putting makeup on. So the way I describe the clothes in the beginning as a way of sort of taking ownership over your body and protecting yourself from the outside world and sort of creating your own identity that is not put on you by them outside. Similarly, I think of color as a way of uh, putting makeup on, of, of kind of coating things, of giving them new meaning. So this is a project called, uh, this is a project for furniture pieces that were, were 
are made uh, using um, architectural elements from very famous 1930s uh, pieces of architecture by Marcello Piacentini, who was is a very popular an architect who a lot of British architects reference. I mean, he was he was an uber uber fascist. Um, you know, he was sort of uh, um, Mussolini's uh, favorite architect for many years. Um, and British architects reference his work all the time as being contextual, um, but they never actually talk about its sources. So I sort of use this as a sort of critical piece to sort of take those elements. And I'm sort of imagining Mussolini sort of wearing makeup and being shoved out onto the, the balcony of Piazza Venezia. So it's kind of dragging Mussolini with these uh, pieces. Um, and similarly, when I get an opportunity in a project to really explore color in a full sort of environment, which isn't very often, it's something that I cal calibrate quite carefully. This, this is an approach um, using a color palette that is, um, I guess, I'll, it's a sort of mix of gender references from uh, what are commonly called, what are commonly childhood colors. I'll come to that later when I talk about um, Melbourne. Um, and uh, color as a critical tool is really, really enjoyable and useful. Uh, this is one example, uh, very impactful and useful, and it's also always enjoyable for the occupants. Um, it doesn't make designing any more enjoyable, it's still a nightmare. But um, this is a heritage project in Bristol, uh, where normally it's a 200 year old grade two star listed, like really imported kind of listed monument. Um, and normally in these sorts of environments, there's a kind of heritage approach where you carefully reconstruct everything that what well, isn't there and then any sort of patina of time that exists, you beautifully reveal it and you can you construct and create your architecture in a kind of deferential um, uh, relationship to the existing space. But I instead sort of painted over all of the historic fabric white uh, in a way that was a bit of a dance with the authorities in a way that they couldn't complain, set everything off it proudly by a sort of three cent uh, 30 millimeters and created all the new objects as a thing that draws all of your attention. So thereby rendering all of the existing historical context that has so much importance into a sort of white non-entity universal background. Um, yeah, this project has been going on forever. Um, ornament is the next step up, okay, for me. There's, a, there's color as the kind of base material and ornament is the thing for me, that takes color and turns it into something which is much more specific rather than just a sort of, uh, I guess, a general feeling of atmosphere. Ornament makes it more specific and it becomes a cultural, a very specific cultural meme or a, a cultural element that I find fascinating because of the way they move between cultures. So a little bit like food, um, food doesn't respect borders, um, food traditions and you know, and noodles and, and there's a famous book about dumplings and how they've traveled all over the world. They connect cultures and they show how things are constantly transformed and shared and there is actually no idea of origin or authentic, which is important for me because in the UK, I don't know about the US, but in the UK there's been a very strong move over the past couple of decades on the left to privilege the local. Um, and in architecture that has translated into privileging the physical, the physicality of the local context. So the existing buildings that exist, the materials like, oh, let's make bricks out of mud that we find in the River Thames because it's local, right? Um, and that's, that's seen as being, and you know, again, this is not, it's not a criticism, it's just because I don't, I, I like to do something else, but there's that, which so everything has to be from the neighboring street or nearby. And then on the other hand, there's a kind of right wing uh, a sort of movement in the UK, which is all about architecture, which is uh, ours, which is British, which is traditional. But actually the end result is very interestingly the same. So actually there's a kind of consensus that is very uh, holistic and, and all encompassing in the UK that you only can design based upon the physical context that is around you. And if you're a left, if you're a sort of progressive architect, you do it in a slightly abstracted way. And if you're a class, if, if you're a sort of right wing architect, you do it in a way that has slightly more explicit ornament. But and I kind of reject that because I, I mean, my family background is a mess. I mean, my parents and their families are from all over the place. I was brought up with I don't know how many languages at home. Um, I'm queer. I don't feel any connection to local context. When I see local context, I see people and cultures and difference. I don't see the physical constraints into which they're put, you know, of the bricks. And ornament is an incredible way of finding context, which is, which is uh, international, transnational, which is constantly changing um, because ornamental motifs move very fast. Um, so a little example here, you have a Chinese porcelain, which was very sought after in the, in the uh, 17th century and onwards in Europe, brought back by Portuguese traders initially. Um, and the 
the, uh, the porcelain was white and it would be brought to Europe. And then in Europe, it would be painted in local workshops with ornament and fired again. And that ornament made its way back uh, to China. And oh, sorry, in the Europe, they tried to paint Chinese style ornaments. So because it was very exotic, they were like, you know, everyone wanted their Chinese porcelain. So the Europeans would try and paint Chinese style porcelain. That eventually made its way back to China. And then in China, um, they saw the Europeans trying to do Chinese ornaments. Um, and the, they thought that's what the, China, the Europeans want. So the Chinese, uh, well, it depends. There's there were different production centers, but in some of the production centers, they started producing ornament that was the Chinese version of the European version of Chinese ornament. And then that was shipped back. And then the Europeans took that and did their own version of it and vice versa. And there was this kind of amazing feedback loop that happened very fast over a few decades that ended up with what we call now Rococo this kind of fantastic misunderstanding, but there's many other ornamental motifs. To be honest, pick any ornamental motif and you have a fantastic story. I mean, from Paisley, which in 50 years went from being something that was developed quite late on in the 19th century in Kashmir to something which spread all over the world into numerous different iterations and became the national, um, the national pattern of places as diverse as India and Scotland. Um, similarly, uh, Roman vegetal ornamentation uh, moving into Celtic uh, traditions, which then moved into Islamic traditions, which then moved uh, further east into Southeast Asia, and then into China, and actually then started to go onto the porcelain and back to Europe. So it's kind of wonderful, you know, feedback loops that don't have a beginning or end and connect people in very, very diverse places. And so ornamental traditions that I, are something that I really love to play with um, and incorporate into my work. Um, you know, and again, this is a way, this is, this is me looking at uh, different five different countries' ornamental traditions, mixing them together to make a project, uh, which is a furniture collection. Um, and again, I had a narrative for this, but it's not really necessary to understand it. And the narrative was a kind of 21st century version of Marco Polo, um, that there was an Italian young, I was imagining a very beautiful Italian male backpacker going to, to Asia and having really exciting club nights out. And there's a night where he meets a really fantastically rich uh, um, uh, Southeast Asian businesswoman, um, and in different countries, different experiences, and each of those represents that. Um, this is a different project. I'm, I'm half Latin American, and there's, that pops up in different ways, and this is kind of exploring um, the queer, sort of queer history there, which is just as interesting as America's and Europe's, uh, which I'm excited to talk about in the book that's coming up. Um, yeah, uh, coming out. So this is, I guess this is a celebration of the idea of coming out as a perpetual thing. So the idea of opening a closet being really something that you want to do all the time in your living room and actually having it open is just as good as having it shut. Um, I'm going to have to be really fast now because I realize I'm going a bit slowly. Sorry. Um, this, uh, I, I'm also, I've been an, I, 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 I'm sort of a bit of a loud mouth, a loud mouth um, because frankly through necessity, because I guess um, I wouldn't have been able to exist if I hadn't been. Um, and I got involved, uh, or I kind of initiated this move in, in the UK to protect uh, postmodern heritage. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of it, um, and actually most of it was being demolished um, in the kind of around 2010 onwards. I mean, we have a lot of rubbish, but we don't have very much good postmodern architecture. Um, and I sort of started a campaign on that, um, and I got the first postmodern building listed, and I got uh, Historic England, or I sort of was involved with Historic England doing the first stylistic survey um, of, of any building type in the UK or building style in the UK. And there's, we're now, I think we're pretty much the best country in the world in terms of protecting our postmodern heritage. Um, this, this all then was happening while I was also writing a book on the topic. Um, I don't love postmodernism, maybe the way that you think of postmodernism. I might possibly hate the kind of postmodernism that you think of as postmodernism, which is the kind of East Coast, uh, let's put a label on everything, stick it in a book, make it formulaic, um, uh, have symposiums on it and murder it type of postmodernism is not what I really like. Um, but it's a particular period of history that I think is really just as important as the earlier 20th century as a kind of efflorescence and explosion of uh, visual culture in spatial design representing a changing society, okay, rather than uh, let's put some funny pediments on things, uh, which is how a lot of people see it. So I don't know, you can read the book, it's out there. Um, and I also agitate on issues and uh, very often that uh, sort of important to me in relation to expression and identity. Uh, this was in the Architectural Review uh, in 2019, which got very widely read. Uh, it's the idea of uh, how in architecture we are, at least in the UK, becoming much, much better now, finally, at, at being inclusive in terms of 
uh, access from people of different types of backgrounds being able to study and then work in the profession, but we are definitely not inclusive in terms of aesthetic representation, right? The symbolic space of our profession. Not, and I'm not talking about architecture students who get to do something exciting when they're in their studio, but I'm talking about out there in the real world, like what we celebrate and what we build and what we validify through the construction of our city, cities as symbolic spaces. Um, and, you know, there's projects that I do which are explicitly kind of explorations for me of what I, what I consider queer in my approach, <laughs> which is very often the fun ones, really. This is a chair um, which is called a Hitotsume Koza chair. Any of you Japanese might know Hitotsume Koza. My grandmother used to tell me these tales about a one-eyed boy who hides on the side of country roads and tries to lick you. Um, uh, it's a little bit scary, um, but he doesn't, he's, not, he's really harmless. So this is a one-eyed uh, monster, uh, which one-eyed monster is a part of the body, um, which uh, has one hole, which is like a one eye. Here's the one hole. Uh, it looks like a toilet. It's a hole in the toilet. It's a glory hole. Not sure if any of you have ever had fun with the glory hole. Uh, I did. Um, and the, the material there we use is a splash concrete, um, which is, uh, I guess you can imagine a really, really fun and colorful ejaculation. Um, so there you go. That, that's kind of embedded in there. Um, and there's a kind of more, there's sometimes more public versions of this. So this is a, um, a project in Melbourne, which is on at the moment. It's finishing very soon, though, uh, called Boudoir Babylon, which was done with sibling architecture. Amazing uh, queer practice in Melbourne, uh, where we were asked to queer the uh, entrance ticketing cafe area of the National Gallery of Victoria for the triennial, which has like a million and a half people going through this space. And this is the kind of main space. So it's really nice of them to commission this. Um, and it's a kind of explicit uh, uh, exploration of gender fucking uh, in the way that I like it. So um, it takes um, a color palette like you saw in the Tokyo flat there, which for me is also a boudoir space. Um, and it takes different color palettes that represent uh, male and female, um, and it mixes them together in a kind of blender, which is a kind of form of gender fucking, the ambiguity that comes from that together with visual representation through 3D forms of body parts, which are always ambiguously between male or female. You, you can never tell. So they're just human. And similarly, also the visual iconography, the graphics, um, they're very childish, but they're all representing uh, or hinting at different body parts. Again, never clear which ones they are. There's also um, the way that the space is used, the theatricality of it. Um, we came through a kind of discussion on three types of, of spaces of queer representation, the boudoir, the Babylon, uh, sorry, the boudoir, the salon, and the nightclub. And this, this sculpture is actually a sculpture, I mean, the space, because it's a whole cafe, but then the central sculpture is actually used every night for, um, for drag performances uh, and other events. Uh, this, this is it in use, I mean, just get, it gets very busy uh, during the day. Um, yeah, this is a piece that you can read of mine uh, in Common Edge, uh, which has been read quite a lot, which is just talking about that idea of representation uh, because, and uh, I, for me, we are an aesthetic uh, profession. Like as architecture begins where building ends, uh, it's where the symbolic element comes into design. It's the element of, it's not just us putting up the tent, okay? It's the moment that you start to weave in ways that do something different than from only thinking about keeping the water out. That's where architecture comes in. Therefore, the aesthetic is very important. Therefore, diversity needs to be incorporated into that symbolic world. Uh, you can read that later. And, and it's, uh, I've been, okay, um, I'm going to go really fast now. Uh, so I, I've always got, I've got lots of work which explores the expression of difference in public space, because for me, it's very important that cities uh, don't become the, the perpetuation of the status quo, which is what, for instance, in Britain, we get because of a kind of pact between the planning profession and the architecture world and also the architecture critical world, that this sort of very narrow idea of contextuality uh, is the only way to design being in keeping. And it's kind of nativist and xenophobic because it means that what about people who are not from, you know, who don't relate to this physical context? What about their culture? What about their history? What about their intangible expression? Like that's context. Why is that not embedded in the city? Um, it's like saying that only white people can live in England because white people are in England. Um, yeah, anyway, and I do that through, you know, expressing uh, my aesthetics, but for instance, these designs are intended, I can go into that detail if someone has any questions, as uh, uh, sort of architectural frameworks for the physical manifestations um, of different community groups and artists in specific areas. Um, so it's, it's moving away from the idea of digital 
in a presentation, you know, everyone can project onto a building these days and you can exist for a day, right? You can have pride going through your city for a day. You can, be, you can celebrate diversity with a float for your architecture practice. But what about building things that are permanent, that are very visually prominent in the city through lots of, with lots of different hands? And so these are obviously all designed by me, but they're kind of imagining a world where there's a lot of difference embedded into the physical fabric. Uh, this is, I mean, there's history to each of these. Um, and I get the opportunity to sometimes do these projects uh, at a slightly larger scale. This is Gateways in King's Cross. That is a kind of narrative. Um, there was a narrative that wasn't conveyed to the public, but for me behind it of the kind of 5,000 year history of architectural ceramics, I'm a little bit obsessed with ceramics, you've probably noticed. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I'll be ending, I'll, I'll flip very quickly after this, but, um, David Wanyarowicz, an amazing artist, multidisciplinary artist from the 80s who died of AIDS early in the 1990s uh, from the wonderful New York scene said, to place an object or writing that contains what is invisible because of legislation or social taboo into an environment outside myself makes me feel not so alone. It keeps me company by virtue of its existence. It is kind of like a ventriloquist's dummy. The only difference is that the work can speak by itself or act like that magnet to attract others who carry this enforced silence. And this is very important for me because this idea of whatever I do, and especially if I get to finally do things in the public space, but whatever I do is validating my existence. But not only that, by the very act of creating and pushing it out there and fighting for it to exist, I'm also communicating, or you, and, and this is the thing, I think everyone who does this, you're communicating to other people that their existence in, in whatever way it is different is also justified. Um, and, you know, people get quite angry because they're like, oh, you're, you're silly and colorful. You're like a, a caricature of what a gay person is. Um, yes, that's my particular aesthetics, but I'm not, I'm not in any way promoting a particular type of aesthetic, but rather just difference. And these are, these are different projects that I've done, which, uh, you know, manage to do that in different ways. This is the, this is the UK's large, uh, second largest uh, birthing center. So, and I've done the, the interiors here and the whole size. And so it's just nice to know that, uh, uh, sort of thousands and thousands of babies are going to sort of be pushed out and go like, oh, colour. So maybe I'll have lots of clients in the future because it's in Chelsea, which is quite a wealthy area. So I've got my fingers crossed for that. Um, and even, you know, I don't want to do temporary things. I want to do permanent things. Nothing is permanent. So I want to do sort of semi-permanent things. Um, but because um, of, I, I, I'm sure some of you have heard of pink wash, I get used as pink wash quite often, but I need to make a living. Again, I don't have a position in the academy. I'm, I've got lots of enemies in the architecture world. So I need to work with these sorts of opportunities. So even when I have to do something like this, which is temporary, I imagine it as a sort of permanent installation. Uh, and I imagine it as part of an urbanism that I would like to create one day. Uh, I was having an opportunity to do something like that permanently in Croydon, uh, creating these wonderful bespoke tiles, if I may say so myself, and creating these absolutely gi gigantic monuments. Uh, but because of COVID, Croydon Council is in great difficulty, along with a lot of other councils in the country. So it's currently on hold. Uh, but there was a whole series of these things around the city centre. It's a very exciting kind of retro 60s vision of the future, that, that town centre there. Um, these are some other projects. And I, I continue to pursue now in a professional way product design. It's actually become a really interesting entire sort of parallel career for me, um, which, has been which has been really fulfilling. And I have these different hats, which I really enjoy putting on you know, from the architectural world to the interior design world to the fine art world. Um, and I really enjoy kind of moving between all of those, you know, doing rugs, doing teapots and mugs, doing handles. <laughs> uh, these are doing quite well uh, for furniture um, and mirrors and things. Um, and I enjoy having all of those different hats on and I want to continue to, to do that. So this is uh, to end a final quote from Olivia Lang, who's an incredible writer, you should read her works, never accept the loneliness that comes from having your existence in any way denied. Create work that resists invisibility and silence. And again, in whatever form that may take. Um, and I'm working on a book at the moment, which is a book that I'm working on it because it's a book that I wish that I had as an architecture student. Um, I could only come across when I was looking for queer issues in architecture, just very, very, very long, complicated academic texts. Um, I couldn't find anything that was accessible and just showed me that I wasn't alone, that we're not alone, that actually in the architecture world, there's so many spaces, there's so many things that have happened in history that belong to us. And they're not, you know, it's not all, uh, I don't know, Valerio, I keep saying Valerio Jati because he's, he's popular at the moment, but you know, it's not all the kind of the, the canon. Um, and so that's going to be coming out hopefully uh, next year. This is Alan Boosbaum's 
um, uh, uh, office uh, home where, where uh, the, his bathtub was in the middle of the office on the left. Um, and on the right is Coppelia, um, which is the world's largest, I think, ice cream store in Havana in, in Cuba, where uh, being homosexual was very strongly persecuted in the early years of the revolution. And ice cream was very much pushed as a symbol of luxury for the masses. Um, but it turned out that that very one symbol of the state was where all of the homosexuals would gather and secretly communicate to each other what they wanted sexually by the color of the ice cream that they would buy. Um, these are both examples by Ivan uh, Munuera, who's an incredible academic uh, uh, on the East Coast, um, who's uh, one of the contributors to the book. And to end, uh, this is a hatch that I made that was rejected uh, uh, called Rimsulation. Uh, I would have been very happy if lots of little rimming characters could have been used in, uh, in Revit and AutoCAD, but sadly the Architecture Foundation ignored me for several months and then eventually replied saying, sorry, but this is not appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that didn't get included, but they probably spent a very long time looking at it closely, trying to figure it out. And then they weren't sure what they thought they saw. Anyway, you guys can hear me, right? Um, I, I, sorry, it jumped a bit. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, I was just saying that um, I'm sure they were spending a lot of time looking at your um, imagery and trying to figure out what exactly it was showing before <laughs> they decided to have to stop it. Anyway, exceptional. Thank you so much. Um, is my internet funky? Uh, it's OK now. OK, I'll try to. It might be, um, it's probably my internet. <laughs> no, it might be mine. Uh, it's getting a little warm in this room. Anyway, awesome. Uh, yeah. for, first of all, Adam, congratulations and thank you for um, this extremely uh, eloquent uh, presentation. Obviously, you, you're a theory, history, intellect as much as you're an artist. And um, I, I guess I was sort of not expecting that. And so I'll probably be reading much more of your work. And I'm super, super um, impressed and happy that you're out there in the world doing this. It seems to me you've really, uh, I don't know, codified and understood uh, and putting together a fascinating understanding. Uh, yes, the discussion on queering. I love your discussion on cheekiness. Uh, I'm actually British and my families, uh, those words were used against us as children. So it's fascinating to see that now as such a spontaneously beautiful um, understanding of architectural expression, artistic expression, identity, and ultimately your use of color, coding, ornamentation. Really impressive. Uh, really understood a great deal of things that I think many of us are still trying to wrap our heads around. So. Um, I don't exactly have a question. I suppose if I'm going to get to a question, I'm curious of how you discussed your work as a characterization, you know, of a queer person's aesthetic, and that kind of maybe used against you or somehow used for you, uh, the idea that there could even be an aesthetic associated with queerness is an interesting one because um, it maps into other territories as you've kind of also studied in ornament. Uh, Charles Moore was my first boss, by the way, um, and his use of color and super graphics is a really interesting thing. Not always the use of his work, but yeah. he was a he was a cheeky character. But also so his, I'm, I'm, his way of his pedagogy sounded fascinating. His way of teaching, yeah, and even his way of running a business. I mean, he really just gave <laughs> us ornament patterns. Is what he would do. He'd give us ornament patterns and say, "Work with these," and we'd be looking at him confused. And really, really, really great. Um, I'm. I'm wondering how you might address that as the notion of, I mean, we talk about a code of belonging and in some ways you're using color, pattern, ornament, uh, inclusive pattern and ornament as a way of somehow being at once subversive, um, anti-normative, uh, pushing boundaries, um, and then in and of itself, it's become an institutionalized, an institutional, institutionalized characteristic of a uh, persona. Um, you're a part of that in some ways. I mean, your work, I never really even saw it that way until you described it that way. 
And I love how then you also pointed out that postmodern agendas that kind of collapsed with your own. Um, some have been shut down, of course, for obvious reasons, and you get shut down by that. Someone saying, oh, you're just a POMO guy, but you're not. I mean, your work is, uh, has, a, has a heritage, I suppose, that maybe you're going to identify in your book. Well, no, the, the book the book is, um, I really don't write about me. So the book is actually going to be a, a massive undertaking with, with up to 80 contributors. Um, so uh, there's not going to be much about me, but hopefully there'll be a lot around, a lot about, a lot around the world. But I, so, I suppose though, you're, are you undermining some notion of some characterization of queer color or are you identifying it? Are you, what are you discovering? Um, so, I mean, just, just in, in, in general, um, I don't, so there's a talk that I give, which is specifically on the, on the topic of, of queerness. And I guess my, my relationship um, with queerness. Um, and I guess the, and because queer aesthetics are very, very important to me, and I'm very interested in them, but there's, I guess there's a there's a complication in the way that brutalism implies that something is brutal, but it's actually the French word for concrete, right? Ha ha. Um, queer aesthetics is a problematic statement because it makes it sound like there's an aesthetic, <laughs> which of course there isn't. Um, and I think that's why people very often, if they ever if they ever see maybe the byline about me talking about the subject, they'll think that I'm saying because they you know they won't necessarily watch the video or read the article, they think that I'm saying this is queer aesthetic. Um, rather, I guess what I try to discuss is the dynamic, mutual, symbiotic, antagonistic relationship or dynamic between the normative um, and that which is just outside of the normative um, and is doing new things because it has been rejected in some way, but that is then regardless, metabolically feeding back into the mainstream in a kind of generative way. I mean, you can think of very large figures like Versace, uh, but throughout history, there's a lot, you know, they're kind of very powerful figures, a lot of these queer kind of characters that I'm very interested in. Um, but they're, they're very powerful, they're very successful, a lot of them, but they're always suspect and they're never truly accepted. They're kind of somehow by being outside of the norms, they then become propelled to a kind of stratospheric level, but they're actually always kind of somehow everyone's waiting to pull them down. Um, and, but it's that sort of, so that dynamic between what is at any given point um, generally collectively accepted as good taste uh, or the norm, that always then there is something that I would consider it, which is the queer, which is doing something outside of that, but then they're not entirely separate. So I'm not, I'm not what you would call a radical queer. Like, I don't think that it's a matter, for me, it's not a matter of existing entirely separate and creating entirely different family groups, economies and ways of existing, but rather it's that kind of constant feedback loop. So it's an antagonistic relationship. So it's at any given point in time, at any given geography in every given place, there would be a queer aesthetic, probably, but it wouldn't be a specific aesthetic. It would be an aesthetic that is defined by its distortion or transformation of what is good taste at a given point in time. And that's kind of the way I think about it. And that's sort of very much, again, I guess, part of my background, which is also, I mean, it's messy, you know, messy ethnically, messy, messy religiously, but Judaism, being Jewish is, I guess, the one thing I can grab onto. And the history of Jews has been very interestingly a parallel history with the history of, of uh, the queer community, as in um, a, a society, a group that's kind of very often very powerful and very close to the centers of power um, and kind of always present, but always suspicious and always slightly outside and never entirely, even when very powerful, never entirely uh, safe and always on the danger of being eradicated. Um, and similarly with the history of Jewish aesthetics with synagogue architecture, for instance, and ornamentation, there's a similar fascinating um, dialogue with local tastes, but always kind of transformed to the exotic because the Jews are seen as the, as the kind of near other. Um, so color for me is very important. Pattern is very important. The way I use it can be seen as being kind of ridiculous and camp, but that's just, I guess, my particular take on 
my distortions of what I found around me. And it's very much a product. And there's a lot of color at the moment in London. Um, and I think that says a lot about the context. I think a lot of us have reacted to the environment that we've grown up in. Um, and so I think the way that I use color is kind of my a particular type of queerness that has grown up in relation to my context in London and my life, and also the other countries that I've, I guess I've, I've had influences from. So it's quite a long answer. That's excellent. Um, Ella, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, um, thank you, first of all, so much for presenting. This has been really interesting. Um, I guess my question was regarding how you describe identity in your work. And, you know, as things become more popular, obviously more people will start to apply it to their own design philosophies and it becomes more normalized. And so how, do you, how would you respond to something so personal to your life experience and that experience of many others? How would you... How would you begin to challenge it if the normalcy almost changed the meaning of it, the nature of it? So, I mean, okay, in terms of, you know, something which is outside of the norm becoming, uh, you know, part of consumer culture, you know, copied by architecture practices, which is happening. I mean, I, you know, I, I get people emailing me like, is that you? And like, <laughs> nobody commissions me. They commission these, you know, Cambridge graduates who have friends who then do stuff that looks like me. Um, but you know, that's normal, right? Um, and that's just that's just part of the process. And then, you know, new new generations coming up are gonna do things which which are antagonistic to the to you know, maybe the context which involves lots of stuff that looks like my work that they're then coming up. And then when they're doing their work becomes popular similarly, it's a kind of constant metabolic process, which I think is very healthy. I wish I could make money from it and I wish I could get commissions, but that unfortunately is very often the case if you're if you're a difficult character. Very often you're influencing certain people who will then go on and do, do work <laughs> which is similar in other uh, in more commercially friendly ways. In, in terms of it being very personal, which it is for me, I have a kind of just personally, I have a kind of horror of popularity. Um, and obviously I want to do work and I would like to I would like to be successful to a degree and I want respect. Actually, part of part of me being uh, having so many difficulties with so many people is because I, I, I want to be celebrated, right? I'm like, I kind of, I exist and I kind of deserve to be celebrated as much as, you know, my friend who does uh, white interiors with lines of green. Um, but when it, when, you know, when there is the feeling that something is becoming popular, it starts to be taken away from you. And I guess it's the, it's a normal uh, syndrome, celebrity syndrome that people feel that, that their identity is taken from them where the more attention that they get and, it, and I've had a very tiny amount of that and it's very disconcerting uh, and I find it very uncomfortable because it does feel like you as something very profound about you is being taken away and sort of shared around so that's a that's a strange feeling that I don't quite know how to relate to but I think is just part of existing in the world and producing work that is very personal. Um. Um, Patwa, I've joined you in. You can ask your questions. You just have to unmute. Hi, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I had a couple of questions. Um, I love your sense of color, and I don't think that we need to identify it specifically as postmodernism. However, it comes in the spectrum where it, it occurs to me that the whites and the grays came before, and in many cases, as far as I'm concerned, they were just as queer. Um, but I guess I had some other questions, but could you react to that? Uh, could you, sorry, uh, could you elaborate? A, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree, but could you elaborate a little bit more what you mean? Um, in the sense of, if you want to think of queerness as otherness, then there was definitely a sense of the whites as sort of rejecting uh, Victorian color in many ways. And then the grays sort of uh, rejecting uh, the, the blankness of whites that almost automatically led to um, something in between, um, some something more pastel. Um, I, I don't know if that makes any sense to you or at all. Well, I, I, I mean, um, 
there is, uh, I, I guess I was sort of trying to say before that I don't, I don't personally think that there is any aesthetic category that can be called queer. I think it's just the approach that you have. So, you know, you can be a practitioner. Um, I mean, I have yet to find any, but I'm, you know, you can do, you can be a sort of, you can queer parametricism, absolutely. I, it, it's more of a, a sort of perception and an approach um, that you are consciously approaching your designs uh, with that aspect of your identity and those questions in your mind, rather than the kind of type of design that you're doing. Um, so I, I personally have kind of, not carefully, but I just have constructed a lineage for me that matches with my personal experiences with my family history and my predilections and tastes, which does relate very strongly to, you know, I guess, campness, kitsch, color, ornamentation, um, exuberance, um, and the distortion of mainstream uh, languages. But, you know, there's plenty of other ways to do it. So that's, I guess that's why it's so misleading to call it queer aesthetics, because it's more of a queering aesthetics. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I wasn't really thinking of it as a queer aesthetics. I was thinking oh, of sorry. it as sort of an, um, uh, an approach to otherness. Um, and, and actually, I just remembered my second question, if I may, which yeah. is that Charles Moore was very wonderful in how he always made very private things very public. Um, for example, a celebration of these showers that were open to the garden or, um, for example, in his his house in Austin, where there was a guest, uh, a guest bed that was basically in the living room. Um, I, I just love that pushing those two things together. Uh, do you think that that represented or was um, something having to do with with queerness? Well, it, yeah, it was at a given point. In, so, again, at a given point in time. Um, there were, I mean, there were also, you know, straight versions of reacting against the kind of hetero, heteronormative kind of nuclear family prudishness of post-war America. You know, I mean, the, the Playboy house was, was one of them, but in a sort of queer context, there, there was a, a sort of range of pra practitioners um, and uh, people just creating spaces like more, but also, I mean, Boostbaum. So in New York, the example that I gave you of the of Boostbaum studio is exactly that. It's the, the you know, the, his bar, the bathroom, the bath is in, is overlooked by the, the meeting room where they would bring uh, clients, uh, which was next to the desks, which is next to his bed. And this idea of kind of breaking down of, of um, boundaries between what's considered, I guess, profane and sacred, like sort of the workspace and, and uh, the body or sex and uh, the quotidian, was very much a theme running through Western architecture that could be considered queer for a, for a, a while. However, the opposite is also the case, <laughs> to be confusing. So spaces which are actually, because those could be seen as a way of um, enforcing a particular um, body type, um, you know, from the cis, there's a kind of uh, cis gay male, um, the celebration of the ideal body. Um, but actually those, the idea of there's plenty of people who don't fit in, who are, you know, gender dysphoric, who need privacy and need their own space. So actually there's also a tradition of kind of closing off and separation, um, which was happening at the same time in those spaces. Um, but yes, I, I would consider it and part of um, a kind of queer tradition of that period. But then again, there were also uh, spaces being produced by those trying to escape the nuclear family norm for straight men which were kind of along those lines. Jimenez, do you want to ask your question? Oh, I can't hear anything, sorry. Yeah, I can't hear you either. Uh, there yes. you go. Great, yep. great. Okay, I was just saying, uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, big fan, of, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, I just, uh, I wanted to no first such an amazing uh, body of work that you've accumulated of, over the past few years. You know, I really just love the sensibility and uh, when you're talking about um, ideas of symbolism. I'm not sure if you exactly use this word, but uh, ways in which we re-represent ourselves uh, becomes a part of our identity. So I think that's super clear and really really wonderful. Uh, and just I guess what I'm thinking about. Uh, on the one hand, the contemporary, 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 oh shoot, I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> you know, like in terms of your relationship, 
your relationship with peers, right? Like I think on the older end of the spectrum, there there might be there might be someone like Sam Jacob uh, on, on the other end of the spectrum, such as yourself. Uh, but maybe space popular these days. You know, there are people who are who aren't afraid of colors, who uh, have you know uh, who approach let's say revivalism or his historicist historicity uh, from the from a very fresh um, approach. Uh, and so on the one hand, I'm wondering if there's a, some kind of dialogue happening between some of these characters uh, in, in your contemporary society world. Uh, on the other, I'm also just, you've mentioned John Sohn a number of times, and I, I, I totally understand uh, the motivation to talk about John Sohn, and, and I think there's a lot of similarities. Uh, however, I'm actually thinking a couple of generations later than John Sohn, whose, works, uh, whose work might be even closer to ways yours uh namely and i don't know if you find offense in this but, but i'm a big fan of uh, william butterfield uh and i feel like butterfield is somebody that no one talks about and i wonder if he if why would i why would i be offended by you <laughs> such a master i mean I, I, the amount the amount of time that i have spent in all souls it's like my spiritual home <laughs> uh butterfield yeah all, all souls by butterfield it's like my uh, spiritual home i mean he's a master he's amazing no <laughs> uh, and but then you know like the, the way you talk about textile sorry not textile uh, ceramics makes me think about also William Morris's relationship with textile uh, I, I just think about these two characters right the two Mo two Williams Butterfield and Morris uh, if they feel even closer to you somehow at, at least from my point of view and I wonder if you you think about this oh yes <laughs> so I mean I'm, I'm a man of I'm a man of many many pleasures in architecture and design I, I love I love a lot but you have pinpointed things that I do love very, very, very deeply. Uh, you know, Keeble, Keeble College Chapel uh, in uh, in Oxford and uh, All Souls Church on Margaret Street are just two of the most incredible spaces um, that I go to. I go to regularly. Um, well, when when there's no COVID, um, and the whole the whole kind of arts and crafts tradition, um, the kind of the union of um, a kind of radical at the time radical socialist agenda for transforming the world which was also deeply spiritual um combined intimately with aesthetics and making right kind of that the, the that morris and the whole group had um is you know i i it's hugely important to me i mean you know visiting the red house is also like a pilgrimage um but for me it's kind of it's kind of a, a parallel simultaneity between them the kind of you know Ruskin Morris, um, also obviously Ebenezer Howard, because um, in terms of urbanism, I think Ebenezer Howard is probably the type of urbanist theory that I I feel most uh, sympathy with. Um, he espouses a lot of ideas that I feel could be very relevant right now. Like I feel like he would completely be with us. <laughs> um, and then on the other hand, there's the the decadence. So you know um, Aubrey Beardsley. Oscar Wilde um, and the entire movement also in France, uh, you know, the kind of fleur du mal, um, early modernism, um, which was exploring, you know, which was just radically undermining the kind of uh, social structures of decorum and good taste through a combination of, of uh, uh, you know, living sexually how they always wanted to, together with espousing new politics, but it was all again wrapped up in aesthetics. And for me, those two are kind of parallel sides of a coin, which for me are in a way the beginnings of modernity or the kind of modernity that I find really interesting that was, I think, present in the uh, you know, 1900 to 1915, and then died when everything got calcified into this dead corpse of what we call modernism after the war. Um, but yeah, oh my God, like, I'll, let's go to All Souls together. Like, <laughs> I, I, it's just the, the, you know, the encaustic tiles, um, the Minton and the, the use of granites, it's just divine. And obviously the, the polychromatic brickwork is something very special. It's interesting. I think he's, Butterfield is often a starting point. I don't know about America, but here um, he's often a starting point. For instance, I have a friend called, who's, who's a very important historian, who's um, uh, very important for Lara and Fred, um, space popular as well, uh, called uh, Timothy Britton Catlin. He's a, he's a historian of the Gothic revival who taught us. Um, and 
you know, he begins with this idea of William Butterfield being used by uh, the, the modernist historians as proof that modernism began in that period because he's seen as a kind of truth and materials person, erasing all of the kind of complexity and interest of his work and saying funny shapes, but you know, that didn't fit the site. He represents the function of it. And you know, the brick is embodied, you know, there's no ornament because it's just embodied in the material itself, which is itself structural. And he points out that that's a, the way that he unravels the kind of modernist selective history making uh, from the way that they sort of start with Butterfield completely misunderstanding him or willfully, willfully misrepresenting him. Um, so thank you for that. I was, sorry, I was pointing up there because I have books on Morris. Uh, I have a steel beam here and I put books on them. So there's a lot of Morris books <laughs> up there. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, peers, uh, it's not just older peers. I have a very uncomfortable relationship with people my age. Like I do not have a good opinion of millennials. Uh, I have had a pretty awful time from, you know, from get the get go. Um, you know, I don't fit in with them. I feel much more comfortable with the younger generation. But um, for instance, it's, it's great, great that you, meant, you mentioned Space Popular. They were a few years below me at the AA. Um, and uh, I think Fred used to used to come to my juries because I, my juries became like a go to event because they were so spectacularly bad. I would get so demolished in such a kind of extreme personal, like ridiculous manner that people used to come to watch the kind of it was almost like watching the gladiator just destroy the animals. <laughs> um, and. I, I think he, he would come, he was one of the people, he came because he actually liked the work, which was really lovely, but other people would come to watch the carnage. Um, and, you know, I, I made contact with them after they left, uh, after they left to Thailand and someone mentioned them to me and they've been really good friends. They are really, it's really lovely to have people who we, our ideas are polar opposites. We have completely different ways of seeing things. Uh, we have colorful work, yes, but we have very different approaches, but there's a, there's a mutual respect, which is lovely when you can find it, where someone, you understand their work and their ideas and you really respect them, and they understand your work and ideas and they really respect them. It's just a really lovely space to be able to have if you're, not, if you're used to being in a very um, uh, combative environment that is quite antagonistic. I use that word a lot because it kind of defines my, my experience. Uh, Sam Jacob, I don't know. Uh, I know of him, obviously, um, but I, I I don't know him. Uh, I don't know him personally. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Stephen says we have to end this. Uh, but oh. you know, I, I, the, the the way that you've been talking about um, your peers and uh, namely uh, uh, Fred and Lara, you know, and and the way that you talk about um, the parametricists, I, I I almost wonder if there's there are you know, let's say two paths of British uh, architectural history that concurrently took place of one uh, started with the Butterfields and the other one started with Paxton by way of Foster, you know, and, and it's really the same, there's even, there's the, the same kind of uh, muscle flexing high-tech work. It's just that the, the path of high-tech has taken us into, you know, uh, I, in the hands of Schumacher. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would posit that there's, so, there's obviously there's Paxton and the Butterfields, but I, I would also posit that together with that, you get a breakdown of the Jeremy, it's the Jeremy Benthams, okay? So the utilitarians. Um, and then on the other side, that side, there's the kind of the sublime, you know, Burkeans. Um, and I think it breaks down that. It's, it's the utilitarians and the romantics. Um, and romance, by the way, for, I don't know any of you guys who don't really know, romance doesn't mean romantic and silly and fluffy. Uh, in that context, it means uh, you know, almost uh, Nietzschean, right? It's that the thing which, which understands that human emotion and psychology is something that has to be factored into everything that you do, that we are emotional, psychological beings, uh, which utilitarianism, which came up with this idea of the greater good, that every person is an economic unit that will always do what's in their good interest, best interest, which is ridiculous, because why was I a drug addict for so many years? I was really not in my best interest. <laughs> why did I sleep with so many people? Um, so <laughs> And that, that's a kind of split that still does define a lot of British culture in general, not, not just in architecture. Um, Adam, as much as we really, really, really enjoy our time together, and I'm really disappointed because we only just got into some of the basics of the questions that you're 
work, your ideas and your explanation of your ideas articulate. Um, we had a review starting at 1.30 <laughs> and I need to um, see if that can be put back together. Tina, I'm sure had a great question. I'm really sorry we didn't get to it, Tina. I don't know, you're there to ask the question, but I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, thank you. Thank no, you, thank I, you, very, thank you. I have very important <laughs> Netflix things to get back to. I, I missed that. All right. Um, hey, everybody. That was thank wonderful. you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. You're, you're mm -hmm. going to be great. I really can't wait to see where, I can't wait to see your buildings built yeah. in urban sites all over. It's going to be fantastic. Hang in there. I think I, I think I think I might end up being an antique dealer with lots of dogs in the countryside, but either way. <laughs> All right. You've already made it work. You've already made work. So it's pretty profound. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye, Stephen. Thank you, Adam. Sorry, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.